My name is Jay Griggs, and I'm here today with my good friend Wardell Kazare, one of the true legends of uh, New Orleans alive at this point in time. And uh, always a pleasure to talk to you, Wardell. My pleasure to, uh, what's going on, Jay? Yeah, you, you. I um, was wondering if you'd talk a little bit about uh, maybe the early days of, your, of what made you motivated to be a musician, okay. and maybe... I heard your dad was a guitar player. My dad played uh, guitar and banjo. Uh, he came up uh, around the time of Louis Armstrong, and uh, before Louis got to have a name and all that, they used to uh, play gigs together and all that jazz. So he had his little experience playing uh, playing music, and then he t joined the army, and uh, he played in the service band and things like that. Man, and that band consisted of about six people in the band. I saw that picture, I said, gee whiz, man, what a band, hmm. a trio. <laughs> uh, so you were raised up around music and the whole Oh, yeah, my mother sang, I have <clears throat> uncles that played uh, pianos, get, not guitar, pianos, a saxophone. A lot of my uh, family members had friends that played music and all of that. They have two brothers, my oldest brother played trumpet, and my second oldest brother played drums. So. We had a, a rhythm section there. I had an uncle that played uh, uh, piano and all that, you know, saxophone players and all that. So we had, we had a nice little time coming up, man. And I remember um, when I was a kid, we used to do a lot of jamming in the, in the, in the front yard, you know, hmm. for the neighbors and all that. Everybody put up some money, get some beer, and they just have a good time, man. All the music friends be there. People dance and you have a good time, which you can't do there today, but that's besides the point. Uh, coming up was different then than it is now. But musically, I was surrounded by music. So then you uh, joined a service? And, uh, were you, well, you, uh, uh, when you got out of when school? The, when, the, um, when, it broke, when the war broke out, the World War II broke out, uh, my brothers uh, was inducted into the Army. One is in the Air Force and one was in uh, uh, Army uh, Special, uh, the drummer. And then they put him on trumpet and he learned how to play trumpet too. Now you're too young for World War II, huh? Oh, not me. I'm saying I was in, well, I was in the Korean War when that broke out. Mm -hmm. and, um, but my brother and then was in the service way before me. I was going to high school at that time. And at this time, I was probably I was in Zebby University, Zebby uh, Prep Band, and I met uh, this uh, famous teacher, Clyde Cole Senior. Hmm. I remember uh, meeting him, and uh, it was through him that I found out what arranging was all about because I didn't know anything about arranging. All I knew they had notes on a piece of paper, and we played it, you know. Uh, but one day in high school. He was sitting behind a desk and the, and the students had had a break period and he's behind the desk writing. So I got up and walked behind him and asked him what he was doing. He was very gracious to explain uh, what he was doing. He was arranging, you know, like I said earlier, I didn't know anything about what that was all about, you know. And it was through him that I got the encouragement to, uh, to learn how to do it. So, um, he used to have a, he used to have a little band that he used to put together with high school students at his house, and I learned how to uh, play with different bands, you know, different styles of music. Oh, Clyde yeah. Kerr Jr. Later, uh, I'm talking about Clyde Kerr Sr. I know, but Clyde Kerr Jr. Who I was friends with uh, told me that, that he had a big band, and he used to see you in there. You played trumpet at that. That's time. right. That's that's what that's what I'm saying. That's what we have because Clyde used to have uh, not only from Zebra prep but from all uh, schools, you know, if anybody was interested in, he'd give lessons free and all of that wow. in his front room, you know, we played his music, man, and, uh, and I got to meet Clyde Gord Jr., then Clyde was very, well, man, Clyde was a, a youngster when I was coming up in here, uh, man, used to run behind stands and knock the stands <laughs> out while we practiced told me that story. and all of that, but uh, <laughs> then he got to be a uh, a, a good teacher himself, you know, he, yeah, he passed away too. But uh, 
All through my life, man, I came across good musicians. Uh, and as far as the other end is concerned, uh, business-wise, you know, that's two different things. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but music-wise, uh, I remember coming up, and I used to, they used to have a, a, an Indian tribe that was in the same block as me, and every uh, every uh, Mardi Gras day or something that, during that season, they used to get together and walk away from the uh, uh, from their homes, they pass in front of our houses, man. I tell you what, buddy, it was funky. Yeah, man. It's early in the morning. They'd be they'd be drunk before the daggone sun come out. <laughs> and man, he has a good time. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? I came to all of that stuff, you know, jazz, uh, water grab tunes, and all of that. So I was raised up in the sense of uh, New Orleans music, per se, you know. Right. So. I grew up around that. Did you write when you're in the service? Did you? Uh, when, I started writing when I was in high school. You know, like I said, I used to get behind Mr. Carr and see what he's doing and ask different questions. So I found that if I would buy some orchestrations already arranged and things that already had the scores and start analyzing and see how they do that, you know. So I got an idea on how to uh, voice and all that kind of jazz from from those, uh, uh, those type of uh, sheets that we used to get at the store. Hmm. Uh, the orchestration, different size bands, all not, you know, to start analyzing some. I, I never had formal training, but training, but I always, if I had to learn something, it was from these uh, published, uh, 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 published uh, music uh, arrangements that they had on there, and I learned how to do that from there, how to transcribe, how to, um, uh, you know, uh, transpose and all of that from from that. And uh, when I, I used to write something for the school band or something like that, little, little notes here, you know, get ideas. And my famous uh, person at that time was, was uh, Harry James. And I remember there was a song that uh, he used to play called Backbeat Boogie. Mm. And uh, I wrote it where the solo that he did, I, I learned how to play the solo and I learned how to, to write the simple parts that the band was playing. And, and I used to uh, play it during the, uh, football games and all that kind of jazz, man. And, well, I heard you were quite a trumpet player in your day. By the time I started working with you, you had kind of put the trumpet down. I had to, man. The pencil was too heavy for the trumpet. For the trumpet. <laughs> <laughs> Took too much time. Yeah. So <clears throat> you got uh, uh, you had a big band back then. What was your name? Your band, the Royal I had Dukes. The, uh, well, really? the Royal Dukes didn't come into play until I got out the service. When I was in the service, uh, um, I went to the service in uh, 1948. Yeah, 1948. I was in. Uh, I went to Japan, and. Uh, I remember when I got into the band and all that kind of jazz, they put me in charge of, uh, uh, you know, my trumpet playing and things like that. They gave me a band to play in front of, uh, not to get in front, to organize a band, a dance band. So I got to organize that with, with the training group. And we used to play jobs in New Jersey. Uh, they had a place called Anya Powell Theater behind that famous uh, uh, novelist, I guess, or whatever, uh, World, War, World War II photographer, that's what it was. And we was on a concert, and I used to write a lot of stuff with, with uh, Dizzy Gillespie band used to play, and I transcribed that, so that got to be my next trumpet player there. Oh, kid, so you uh, playing bebop back then? Oh, I was playing bebop at that time, yeah. So I, I transcribed all that kind of music, and uh, I used to play that on on a gig. I remember one job we played, man, uh, uh, what was this song called? Da 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 da. Love will come back to me. And, and Dizzy had an arrangement on that, it was in 5 4, you know, all kind of broke up rhythm and all that kind of deal. So there was a, a lieutenant that came out, a major or something like that, came out to me and asked me, oh, well, look here, Sergeant, you know how to play this song? I said, what song, sir? And he told me, love will come back to me. And just so happened, I had it. In so five. I said, sure. <laughs> so I played a daggone thing. Uh, 
when we finished playing, he said, here, son, when are you going to play that song? I said, son, I just come from playing it. <laughs> you know, Dizzy, man. He, it was the same song, but it, it just didn't sound like it. It wasn't no pretty thing, but it was pretty as far as we was concerned because it was jazz, you know. But he wasn't used to hearing it in that, in that uh, way. Huh. So I remember that, all of the service and things like that. Uh, so anyway, we was playing at the Only the Power Theater, and uh, it was just so happy, man. They broke the, uh, they asked me to stop playing, and they got on the microphone and asked all of the soldiers in a, that was in the, uh, in the theater and the band members that we had to leave because we just broke out the, with the war. Uh, the, the, the North Korean crossed the 38th parallel uh, the South, in South Korea, yes. I mean North Korea. And uh, that's when the war started. So I got a, uh, they put us off the, off the uh, stage and they had us to go back home and start packing up <clears throat> because they're gonna send a lot of band members <clears throat> to Japan. I mean to, to Korea, <clears throat> excuse me to Korea, so when I got to the place, man, they had all the, uh, they had rifles that was in, uh, that was packed up in grease in the big barrels, and you had to dig in there to pull the, pull the grease, up, you know, pull the rifles out of the grease and, and uh, uh, clean the rifles off and anything like that, because <clears throat> the next morning they had us in a full field pack ready to go to Korea. Mm. They had me on the, on the, that, <clears throat> oh my, they must have had about 20 or 30 guys from the band that was going to uh, Korea. So they had me on that, and they, they pulled me off the, um, they pulled me off the truck, uh, the warrant officer did with orders to take me down and replace me with someone else. And it just so happened that uh, when they got to Korea, the guy that took my place, he was one of the first ones that got, got killed in the Korean War, mm. uh, from the band at least. And uh, that would have been a plane you would have been on or something. Or? That would have been a, that was not the plane. It was a, they was in combat. Oh. And when they landed on the, wherever they was gone, that's when they. He got killed. The uh, daggone thing exploded in his head, man. Oh. So uh, I never forgot that, and I always promised that I would write a mess. Uh, because of that, in Thanksgiving, you know, for being pulled off that truck. Is that the one you did uh, some ten years ago? Or yeah, something? you did that. Yeah, oh. the Creole mask, they call it. Um, uh, I'm in the uh, misc of doing something else right now that you're associated with, um, playing guitar, as usual. Um, we're in the final stages of finishing that, baby. By next, uh, by next, uh, um, next season. Hopefully, we'll have uh, done it in January. It'll be finished then. Yeah, we we're hoping to finish this <coughs> year before you know before Christmas, if we can do it. I don't know, but huh. sometime in March or something like that, it should be out to the public then. Uh, oh. 11, 10, 11, yeah. yeah. Well, before we get too far into the future, I'm still interested in what happened in the 50s and later on when you, when did you start doing all this stuff at Cosmos and, and the, the Royal Dukes and well, all that? I mean, was that? Well, uh, I heard your band used to back up all, everybody when they came into town. Or, well, there, there was a lot of concert that we <clears> gave <throat> with, uh, uh, well, first of all, the, the band that I made up was called the uh, Royal Dukes of Rhythm. And it was composed of a lot of uh, uh, veterans that was in the army, and uh, uh, the government gave pensions to two different musicians or whatever you want to learn, and send you to school to learn that. So I went to that school, and after a while, they made me a, uh, I got a teacher position there, and we made up a band called the Royal Dukes of Rhythm. And, uh, uh, it was called a Royal Dukes of Rhythm, and I had a group that was in Japan. It was called a uh, uh, not the Royal Dukes, it was called a Dukes of Rhythm. And this time we, uh, we called the, the band here, we called it Royal Dukes of Rhythm. Hmm. So it was a playoff of the band that I had in, California, in, in, uh, in Japan. 
uh, I played a couple of uh, mainly, uh, when I started off, I did mainly um, uh, a dance that, that the black uh, carnival clubs used to give, you know. Mm -hmm. They got it one one a year or something like that until it started getting, getting a name. And uh, gradually, uh, they had people that heard the band and used to uh, book us to play behind different artists that would come in town and be at a theater. And we used to play, I used to write the arrangement for these artists, say like uh, Taj Mahal, uh, Gatebound Brown, um, Root Brown, um, who else, uh, they did a lot of stuff for and I met a lot of people from the industry that was, you know, that attended the uh, things too. So gradually, then I started getting a few little, uh, little white carnival club or uh, dancers that I played for. You know, I gradually got into that, into that atmosphere uh, with white clubs and things like that. But uh, it was a gradual uh, progression of how we did it, and from there. I met David Downey and another producer called uh, Joe Jones. They heard the band and liked what I do, what I did, you know. So they wanted to do if I would write for, uh, especially Dave. Dave had his little band that he that he had. And he went through some arrangements, you know. Someone to do some arrangements for his band. So I did a lot of arrangements for his band, and from there he did some recordings. So I did record a lot of records with him, a whole lot of recordings. Um, Actually, when I was just a little baby boy, I had a chance to work with you on some of that stuff. You wasn't on that baby. <laughs> <laughs> we did, I remember doing Brooke Benton with you. <clears throat> yeah, uh, yeah, Brooke Benton was done from people from, uh, from uh, across the river. Uh, who was that that uh, we did at his studio? Uh, Man, I know you know the piano player. What's his name? Um, I did a couple of albums with him. Oh man, come on, you know who I'm talking about. Uh, shucks, he'll come to me anyway. Uh, he's he's oh, man, he was a great piano player. Still is, as a matter of fact. And he married some lady from there that was. Uh, well, anyway, uh, they got married, so I used to go across there and uh, help him do some stuff. Uh, I'm not talking about Ronnie studio. Cole. Ronnie Cole. Ronnie Cole. Yeah. Excuse me, Ronnie. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, now, you know what? I, I never have heard you talk much about is the uh, whole Cosmo days. Didn't you do a lot of stuff at Cosmos when they were doing oh, yeah, man. all those hit records that were coming out? Oh, on? yeah, man. Uh, I mean, y'all put this place on a map. Well, the... The map was already done before I even got into the business, <laughs> you know, because Deb and all of them people with Fats Domino, they really made the uh, uh, Cosmo Studio then, you know. Right. But then but I. But you were doing like the Dixie Cups? Was that a Cosmos? Or was that like? No, the Dixie Cups was done in New York. Oh, okay. Uh, I did the Dixie Cups in New York. I did. Um, uh, Kate Mount Brown, I did. Was it that studio? No, Gabe Mount Brown was done at some some other studio. Uh, I think he had his own studio and he did something somewhere. Mm. And uh, no, but I came across a whole lot of good artists, man, like Joe Johnson himself and then Dave. Uh, we came out with Dave, Dave Adamu, uh Big Chief, and that was uh, that got to be an interesting. Uh, uh, from the industry then, man, that, that got attention. to be a big, a big record. It still is, you know. Yeah, well, those horn arrangements, that horn arrangement on Big Chief. Uh, yeah. Dr. John told me he was on that session and said when you, we came out with those horn parts, he was so busy listening to your horn parts that he forgot to play the guitar. <laughs> so he said, that's why there's no guitar on that session. Yeah, that's a funny, that was a funny arrangement. See, at that time, uh, if I'm noted for anything uh, around that time of the year, it was because of the... Uh, uh, I did most of the big band stuff, you know. Where, whereas that uh, stuff like Fast Diamond on them, they maybe it was two or three horns, and the rest was rhythm. Mm. But this band, you know, when I used to be on, I used to have all them five saxophones, three trumpets, three trombones, uh, and at that particular section, I had all those horns, and then I had. Uh, 
I had this uh, a Smokey Johnson was playing drums, and he played so hard that his uh, between the thumb and the forefinger that it split his it split his that membrane right that skin right there. Man, he had to patch his arm up. Um, I mean, his finger up. He broke the uh, uh, the head of his drum. He had to redo that. Whack uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, 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 Professor Lawn had. You had to tie his feet to the uh, to the piano leg because when when he plays, his rhythm is really his his, his leg hitting against the, uh, his foot hitting against the the uh, the. Uh, uh, Piano? The, the piano, you know. It was out so, of time or was in time just loud? Oh, no, no, it was in time. <laughs> That's why he kept his tempo. He wasn't even okay. drums with him. Oh, yeah. So uh, when we got there, man, he, you know, like around, like, like I said, around that time, man, they didn't have no big band stuff like that. And when we broke out with that, man, he could hardly play. I think we tied one of his hands. It had to be his right hand, I'm more than sure, <laughs> to his back. And his left hand played that thing all the way through, with just the left hand. On Big Chief? On Big Chief, yeah. <laughs> they, uh, I remember. Yeah. Uh, I, just, uh, I had my oldest brother that was playing. He, he made up a little gadget with a, a broomstick, and he took the corks out of, uh, out of uh, soft drink caps, you know. He took those out and made shakers to put on the broomstick. And that's where that... Instead of tambourines, you hear that it wasn't tambourines. That was a, uh, you know, coke bottle, coke bottle tops. Oh, uh, that's fine. <laughs> on on that thing. So, uh, hmm. well, that did. No, it ain't my fault. That was a big hit you had here. here. Yeah. Was that before that or that? No, it ain't my fault. Was done at that Cosmo. As a Cosmo. Oh yeah. Because yeah. you know that song's been. I know you know that's been sampled and sampled by all kinds of people. Yeah, I know. Uh, used in a lot of different. Yeah, honestly, and we got a lawsuit going on right there because of that same song. But they'll get away from that. Somebody made a lot of money out of it. Though. Yeah, that's what we're trying to see. What kind of money <clears throat> we're getting out of it? They made it all. Mm -hmm. uh, we did that there. We got to cut another song that was done over by Kaz that was, a, 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 I didn't know it was this well known, but Barefoot was yeah. done over by Kaz. Who did Barefoot? Uh, uh, Barefoot, uh, uh, that was Robert Parker. Robert Parker. Robert yeah, we did Parker. a gig with him fairly recently. Huh? Yeah, Still yeah. Um, wow. So, uh, what about when you started having those hits with uh, like uh, Groove, Groove Me, the Malico yeah. stuff? Yeah. When did that come We out? did Malico records in Jackson, Mississippi. There was a guy that uh, that had King Floyd under contract. Groove Me. That's Groove. a really great tune. Yeah. yeah uh, and we, uh, he went up to Mississippi and he made some kind of arrangement with the... Uh, uh, with the studio to do that song, uh, Groovin', and we did the whole album of uh, of Cape Floyd stuff there, man. As a matter of fact, every song on there uh, turned out to be uh, very good songs, you know. Now, uh, you told me you were playing piano on that. Is that true you play? Yeah. <laughs> you play piano on all that. Let me tell you, man, me a piano player, before somebody be thinking I'm a piano player, which <laughs> I am not. But you told me you played piano on that. You had but I piano. did. I, man, let me tell you something. To be honest with you, man, every hit that I had, I was playing the piano. Uh -huh. But what I'm saying is I'm not a piano player per se. I can sit down and I can play chords and I can cover up with a groove. And that's the extent. Now, if I was to take a solo or something like that, I'll walk away from the piano because... I just don't had I didn't have that dexterity to to play notes. I can play <laughs> chords, but I can't tinkle. I call it right. tinkle. Uh, and then we did at the same session, as a matter of fact, we did uh, uh, the, the thing by Gene Knight, Mr. Big Stuff. Mr. Big Stuff. That was at the same session, man. Huh? Mm. We did that, and that was a, a, a several. Was that the same day? Same day. I'll be doing. And there was another guy, Joe Wilson, came out, and we did some songs from Joe Wilson's uh, uh, session that was that was reduced, uh, that was played by 
uh, Redbird Records at that time, and it, they took that. So we did a, a whole lot of stuff over there mm. uh, at Malaco, you know. Yeah. You came up with that groove, the bass line on Groove Me? Oh, yeah. Oh, I love that bass line. That's one of my favorite all-time yeah. bass lines. As a matter of fact, when we did it at the studio, the guys, the guys, the guys said, damn it, what this thing? And I'm going to tell you something else, man. A lot of people don't know. That's all white guys that's playing on that session. Was that those guys, like Duck Dunn and those guys from, uh, that were at, uh, oh, shoot, what's the name of this? Everybody was using those guys? Or was this a Malico rhythm section? Was that the? Well, uh, uh, all those guys, man, they, they were used Steve to. Steve Cropper and those guys? Yeah, I don't one? know about Steve. Uh, there was a Plunkett that played get, uh, guitar. And one of the famous guys is that uh, John, I forget his last name, man, but he's one of the best uh, um, country western producer hmm. in, in Nashville. He was the drum on, on all those sessions, man. Hmm. Uh, so we had, a, we had a good time there. I really enjoyed working there. And the guys was easy to work with and things like that. It wasn't no... If you ask them to play something, if they wasn't familiar with it, they'll learn it. You know, mm. So we had a good time doing that. Well, when you were here in town, uh, your rhythm section back then, and I guess this would have been mid-60s, it was a uh, Mac Rabinac, Dr. John was in your rhythm section? Or? Dr. John, I mean, let me tell you about Dr. John. Dr. John had his own thing way before I got into, the, uh, into recording, because he used to work, man, he went, when he was 15, 16 years old, Used to be around those uh, around those studios, learning how to write and play piano. That's hmm. why he intimidates a lot of people right now. That uh, if he's on the session, I mean, if he's out of gig, they wouldn't want to play behind him. Hmm. I mean, you know, another piano player don't want to get on the same stage with him because he's so well versed. Yeah, man. Well, Gee, he, he sure does have the New Orleans thing down. Yeah. Uh, he was on a lot of things I've done. As a matter of fact, we did something for um, uh, uh, Joe Tex, I remember years Joe ago. Tex. Uh, we did <clears throat> something for him, and we can't, put our, our, we can't put our finger on what it was because we did a whole album for him. Man, he was, he was an artist. Oh, God. We uh, I know when I hear you and Mac talking about all the stuff y'all did together, it's like... It goes on and on and yeah, on. Yeah, man. Uh, I remember I did something uh, with Aaron Neville, and uh, it was in New was it? Yeah, it was in New York. And was so happy that he was at a gig somewhere, and he finished the gig and coming down the uh, escalator, and I was coming up the escalator, and he jumped the dividing part between the, uh, the up and down escalators. And you say, what the, what did you do behind uh, Mona Lisa? I said, what do you mean what I did? Uh, he said, man, you, get, you put a card in there, man. It's a mysterious card. And it wasn't a mysterious card, but it was out of place, you know? Right. Uh, Not for you, though, huh? <laughs> that's the trouble, man. Uh, <laughs> I hear some things that have nothing to do with the... Uh, with the song itself, with the chord pattern, anyway. And, uh, but I just love doing it. That's what I hear, you know? I got uh, a quick story about the Mona Lisa thing, because uh, a couple years ago when Joel Dern, what's his name, Joel Dorn? Yeah. When he passed away, they did that, uh, ben, not Benefit, they did a, a, a big party, not a party for his passing. Memorial. Uh, memorial, that's what I'm trying to say. And uh, so they had you come up to... Uh, act like you were conducting the strings on Mona Lisa, right? Yeah. Big, giant PA system. And uh, so we're, we're walking out. I'm, ro I'm rolling you out on the stage. I came to help you out to get through, you know, get through mm -hmm. everything. And on the way out, Mac, Dr. John sitting on the side, he's saying, Jay, don't do that. <laughs> Jay, don't roll him out there. It's going to be a big mistake. <laughs> so I get you out. There's probably five, 6,000 people there. And uh, when I helped you stand up, you thought you were facing... <laughs> You thought you were facing backwards band. like you were facing the band. And I'm conducting the dance right, so, rhythm section. So he I'm said facing the, <laughs> face the audience. So he's conducting facing the audience and no, doesn't realize he's doing it. Man, the cameras are going off like crazy. People loving it because of, that all sounds great. And at the end of the song, Wardell turns around and bows to the band. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I remember we were talking that, about man. getting house. 
<laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> I came back and Max said, that worked. <laughs> that worked. <laughs> anyway. That's a, man, let me tell you something. That's, that's one of my greatest guys, man. Uh, yeah, he really he's a good is, guy. Because he's he really a very is a good truthful guy. man. Uh, that was at Lincoln Center, huh? Yeah. It was at that big shell outside yeah. of Lincoln Center. As a matter of fact, it was outside the uh, uh, Lincoln Center right, at that time. Right, right. Yeah. Well, you've been doing Lincoln Center some this past couple of years. You went back up there and did some stuff on it. Yeah, they had a uh, they had something at at the uh, at the at the place, and it, it was a death called my death. So uh, Wardell Kazar. Yeah. Day. So uh, I was very surprised that they had me to come there and do that. But they honored me, right? Now. Uh, yeah, you've been getting some good yeah. accolades. You got an honorary doctorate from uh, well, well, you know, so, I mean, the 70s, now, uh, you were doing a lot of stuff with Alan Toussaint and... Well... At Sea Saint Studios and all that stuff, you have I did a lot, uh, a lot of things we did at that Alan and them. Uh, I think I remember doing a something with you. I think it was elevator-type music that we, we did. We did do a bunch of that. It was yeah. To, it was eleva music. elevator funk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were supposed to do 500 songs for... Uh, for a European market, and the money was real short. <laughs> yeah. that? But we were supposed to do 500 songs, yeah. and we got about 40 into it. But I wish I could. I wish I could hear that again. I think Me that too, man. Some uh, funky stuff. We did some, some good players. things. Uh, <laughs> we did a couple of songs, and that was out of. Uh, it was real nice, man. Uh, mm -hmm. But we did a lot of stuff together, man. I remember. Uh, Weren't you on that thing with me when we did the uh, 1988 uh, uh, convention for the uh, Republican Party, I think? Uh, uh, I probably played that. Yeah, you was, because I remember you standing next to me doing that. Yeah. Uh, hmm. That was well received then. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Prayer breakfast, that's what it was. We it was didn't. Prayer breakfast. You wrote a lot of that meter stuff too, didn't you? Write horns behind the meter. Oh yeah, we, I oh, did a, that album. Uh, uh, Fire on the Bayou. Fire on the Bayou album, yeah. That was some funky. That's before I met you. That was some funky stuff. Yeah, uh, that's what I'm saying, man. I I, I came across some nice people uh, doing that. You know, the meters. Uh, then a group after to call themselves. It wasn't the meters after that. A lot of them. Uh, the Neville brothers came up with their own stuff. <clears throat> I did some stuff with them, concerts and all that with them too. Mm. Uh, Alan, I did some concerts uh, on the road with him, promoting the album that that he did, and I wrote the uh, the stage arrangements for that. Uh, yeah, Alan. Uh, uh, I remember Ruth Brown came up one day, uh, we did a, a concert and he asked me to do the arrangement for that. I said, sure, just send me the record. So her manager sent me the record and uh, I said, now you're doing it the same way? She said, yeah. I get down there, man. Um, come down for rehearsal, she's up there and she could not sing the same, she couldn't sing the song in the key that it was in. It was about three and a half uh, 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 keys lower. And I found that out, you know, between uh, these artists when they get of age, man. I mean, the, the, the voice keys dropped. Yeah, the keys drop. And the good thing, man, I had musicians at that time that can transpose, transpose you know. So it, it went off real well. She was up there complaining, man, you must think I'm crazy to sing that same key. And we got to be very good friends after that.